to make sure that families know that life needs to be celebrated. Welcome folks to Guided Grief. Grief. My name is Nicholas Welsenbach, your friendly neighborhood funeral director. I am sitting here with Father Gary Thomas, pastor of Sacred Heart and Saratoga. And we're excited to be talking about um, the intersection of faith and grief and the path through and guiding families through those very difficult times. One of the, uh, something I saw recently that might help us in our conversation today, and it uh, very cute, was a Snoopy and Charlie Brown snippet, and it has Snoopy and Charlie Brown sitting on the dock looking out into um, everything, and, and Snoopy says, we only live once, and Charlie Brown says, no, you only die once. So, and I know that in our faith conversation, um, in the afterlife, uh, you know, and how you would communicate to people in the faith world, that might um, stoke some conversation, but I thought it was a, a fun cartoon to open mm -hmm. up to, and certainly to share with our staff uh, here at Darling Fisher. Um, can you share with us your uh, introduction? First, welcome, Father Gary. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for inviting me to be here and uh, having this conversation and to, to, to participate in this uh, in this podcast. I'm very excited to have you. I, I would love to start with uh, your introduction, which is different than most, into uh, funeral service. So you, you, you and I share a, a path history, but um, can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was uh, 14 years old when uh, I was first employed by the funeral home that was one block from my parish church. And uh, it all kind of either happened providentially or coincidentally, and I don't believe in coincidences, so I do think somehow um, Divine intervention. You know, of some kind. I mean, it wasn't all planned out exactly, but the local mortician uh, uh, offered me a job through my mom and said, if he'd ever, your son would ever like to come and um, would work here, uh, I'd be very happy to have him. So when I was 14 years of age and a freshman in high school, I went down and had an interview with Mr. Lincoln. And um, then uh, he hired me to uh, largely uh, greet people at the door on the weekends, uh, answer the phones. Uh, in the summer times, I would cut the lawns, I would polish the rolling stock, uh, I would haul flowers. Um, For our younger viewers, that would be um, the hearse, the limousine, vehicles. Right, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> right. sorry. sorry for the for the technical <laughs> language. But largely, I did a lot of janitorial work, but I also did, you know, I was uh, in a suit or a sport jacket with a tie and uh, greet people, welcome them. Many of the funerals uh, that we had at, uh, at uh, Nauman and Lincoln were for people whose families happened to be people I knew because he, that firm handled most of the parishioners from our parish and the church was one block away. So I ended up working for uh, that company for five years and then later went to work for a, a different funeral firm where I was able to get more experience, have better hours. By this time I was in college. And by the time I finished my, um, uh, my uh, years in college, I had decided, I had to major in business, that I thought I'd eventually I would eventually own my own funeral company. And it was, at that point in time, you were that committed to the vision right. of a funeral director. That's yeah. incredible. And so I had a chance to buy into a firm in my hometown of the other uh, competitor across town, and I went to work for them in South, South San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay. And I worked there about 18 months and it really didn't work out. So I ended up coming down to Silicon Valley, which it was called Santa Clara Valley in those days. And I worked for Spanglers for about eight months. And then Jeff Fisher, uh, whose grandfather started Darling and Fisher, and I went to mortuary school together and uh, knew each other well. And I was also at the same time discerning the possibility of the priesthood. And I was dating someone very seriously at the time and broke up with my girlfriend and then Jeff called and said one of our guys had a very, very serious uh, heart attack. Would you be willing to consider coming to work here? So I went down, I met with his grandfather, his father, the manager of Campbell, and uh, Jeff. So Clyde, Jack, and was it and Doc, Doc, Doc at the time? And okay. Jeff, and um, they said, you know, if you decide you want to go into the seminary and you finish your apprenticeship, which I still had a year and a half to go, you have our blessing. So within that year and a half, I made the decision after a long, long, long story that I really felt more called to the priesthood, and, but I continued to work here all the way through the time I was ordained a deacon. 
and it was a really great experience. Wow. And uh, the, the, the Fisher family are still good friends of mine and treated me very much like family when I worked here, as they really did all the employees. This was the best firm by far I ever worked for. And you presided over the services for Clyde and no, I, I, pres I gave the homily, I gave oh. the sermon at Jack's funeral at Calvary Church in Los Gatos. Oh. I was at Clyde's funeral, but I, part I, I was the homily. So when Clyde died, I, was, uh, I wasn't ordained at the time. Oh, okay. And so they brought a minister, and actually they brought a minister and a Catholic priest who was very, very good friends of the bishops at the time. Gosh, I, I'm um, sitting in the seat that I sit in today, uh, knowing that history, your rich history with them, and then Clyde and Jack and Jeff. I, uh, I wake up every morning when I stick my feet in my shoes and knowing that they're <laughs> a little bit bigger than maybe I ever anticipated because they were, uh, they are and are still incredible people in our community. Yeah, so and they had a real sense of a real, I think, a very in, in, um, um, intentional communal mindset. I mean, I really think they saw their, they saw the business and the firm as really being an integral part in, into really the social fabric of, of uh, San Jose Campbell Los Gatos, for sure. Uh, for you, what was that piece that drove, uh, not drove, but guided you to becoming a part of the clergy in the seminary from funeral service? Because, you know, maybe we can come back to it after about parallels that are associated yeah. with the minister. Um, but what would have been that I mean, that's something intrinsic, I think, in anybody or uh, within that says, I, this is, I need to do this to help. I, th I think for me, uh, after 35 years of being a priest, I think for me it was being able to walk with people at significant moments in their life around how does God uh, dovetail into people's lived experience. And so certainly... In the, in, the mortuary, in the mortuary profession, in funeral service, you do have, in a sense, a very privileged opportunity as a funeral director uh, or a member of a funeral staff, funeral company staff, to be with people in the initial days following the death of a loved one and to get them through the funeralization memorial aspect of recalling, remembering, and um, really bringing full circle the person's life as we knew it physically on earth. But for me, I think being able to be able to walk with people at other moments, at other times, and to have the complete liberty, um, you know, as a Catholic priest, I don't sell something. In funeral service, you don't really sell something either. You make, you make services available. Right, as a guide. But, right. But in what I do as a priest, I don't have to put a price tag to it. I mean, in a business, the church has a business element too, don't get me wrong. But in, in what I do, I, I have the liberty that the people of God have given me and that the church asks of me by asking me to, be, to live celibately. It gives me a kind of liberty to be at people's, to be available to people anytime, basically anytime they need to come. Now that doesn't mean I'm on 24-7, but it does mean that... There is a parallel there in funeral service there though. Yeah, no, 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 no there is. Being on, no, because right? I was on too. I was, right. I was on four nights a month. Absolutely. And we oftentimes would get calls at two in the morning. Right. You know, I'd go out to a convalescent home or someone's home, you know, and be there. And there was always something, as a little aside, it was always something a little eerie when I would go to someone's home, it wasn't convalescent, when I would go to someone's house and the family's all there and it's midnight and they're all emotional and you're trying to be as delicate as you can in removing the, the human remain, the, the remains of their loved one, the body of their loved one. And sometimes they would be in the room with you, sometimes they would step out of the room with you. But there was just something that about the night, it wasn't that it was spooky, it was just a bit I don't know. It just was different than when it was during the day, um, and so yes, you you know, funeral service. You have to be available like I do, but I feel that I can walk with people in many more venues than just the one that deals with death, and I think that's probably what 
brought me, drew me to becoming an ordained priest. Um, as well as, you know, when I'm in the, when I worked in, in funeral service, I wasn't there to, to talk about my relationship with Jesus Christ per se. As a Catholic priest, I can do that, not to proselytize people, but I can have that um, liberty in a different kind of way and a different kind of venue than I was able to do in mortuary service. Because as a, as a uh, mortician or funeral director, someone comes in and you're placing that on them. Right. You're bestowed, because right. we serve all walks. Right. We do, you're right. Someone's you're right. walking in your right. door, you're like, this is actually what I believe. This is part of the right. fabric of my being. Right. And if you're here, you want to sure. bear witness to this. And be Absolutely. And, and obviously, I respect all faiths and even those folks as well who may for one reason or another, choose not to believe, okay, that's, you know, I mean, that's the path that they may have chosen for a while or maybe for their entire life. But when you're in funeral service, the agenda is, how can we best serve you? In the religious structure, I have the opportunity to really talk about moving people from one point to another on a spiritual basis and not just simply get them through the initial days of the grief process. Right. I need a, we're kind of a conduit. Yeah. You know, uh, we need someone to bring a loved one into their care. Sure. And they need someone to contact, uh, and many times a church organization, of, sure. uh, to have that service. So they, it's almost like a path, uh, a necessary pass through. But you get someone um, for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. or you can create that. How do you stay in touch uh, when people are going through uh, their grief path, whatever that might be, in the Catholic faith, is there ministries within mm -hmm. um, that you guide people to at Sacred Heart or within our diocese that are consistent? Um, we have a bereavement committee at Sacred Heart, so the bereave we have a rep from the bereavement committee present at um, every funeral plan, um, whether it was with me or the Proke Vicar. Um, or whoever's planning the liturgy, uh, the, the funeral liturgy. So somebody from the bereavement committee is always present, uh, and they have access to the entirety of our facilities for our reception following the service. But as well, we also have workshops that we do in the course of the year and gatherings for people who have lost loved ones within the course of that year, or even more than the course of a year, where people can come and they can plug in to services that we provide for, for grief, um, grief counseling, grief therapy, and just sometimes just getting into a session to be able to talk about in a group setting, you know, what it's like going through the loss of a loved one. We also can provide them avenues with uh, professional therapists, if that's something that they believe that they need, um, who are readily available locally. We're very blessed in, in Santa Clara County where we have a lot of very, um, very well, very skilled um, mental health therapists and others who are just simply in the in the in the, in the service of uh, uh, giving assistance and support when people aren't going through grief. How, how much do you find that listening is the integral part when someone's coming to you, or is that because they're coming and they need your? Um, they need you to guide them on their faith path. But I feel so often that people need just a pair of ears for that unloading. And is that something that uh, when you're going through defining that liturgy that you have to hear so yeah. that you can guide? Sure. Um, yeah, no, listening is essential. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the definition of a priest, in my humble opinion, is that I am a, I'm a, I am a doctor of the soul. So, just as if you would go to your own physician or a specialist for a physical issue or even a mental issue, the, 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 the physician or the other healthcare professional can't really help you or assist you until you tell the person what your symptoms are. So in the same way, when people come to plan the liturgy, I don't usually just sit down with them. I just sit down with them and pray. Then we have some initial conversation um, and I try and answer the initial questions that they may have. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the fact that this, whether it's their dad or their husband or their uh, relative or friend of another sort who they're responsible for um, 
you know, planning the, the, the liturgical aspect of this person's uh, funeral, um, that we clearly hear and listen to what their needs are. And therefore, my role is not to in any which way impose. My role, my role is to say, these are the options that are available to you as we attempt to put together an experience of prayer that's going to be tailored to meet your needs and the needs of the people who are going to come for the, for the funeral service itself. So yeah, I mean, this, listening is essential because um, you really can't help someone or assist someone or support someone until they kind of tell you where they're at with, these, with this matter. And there's that trust that's born out of that, yeah. like, oh my gosh, I've been heard, mm -hmm. and now I can I can have this mm -hmm. funeral liturgy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's a language specific, you know, the, right. the terminology. Right. I have been in a funeral liturgy with you, and one of the things that I'd like to ask and uh, maybe have you expound upon, and I've shared this with you in the past, many times I've been to um, the funeral liturgy, and it starts and it ends, and there's no guidance as to what's happening because uh, we've discussed earlier that there is there's Catholic people present there's uh, non-practicing Catholics Christians non-Christians and all walks of life that come to a service to be a part of someone's life sure. but when I walk in there's the uh, the blessing with holy water and um, the placing of the pall, incensing and, and the guidance. Can you share like you do at your services, which I'm very grateful for, and I know everyone that's present with you at that service is grateful for, but share why that's an integral part of that funeral mass or liturgy. In the Catholic tradition, uh, we're very, very symbol rich. But unless you're really familiar with the meaning of what those symbols are attempting to express, the symbols can become very, very empty. And, and the liturgy can become very ritualistic. And so I find the, the, the value of being able to explain the symbology is essential so that people therefore can make the connection between what I'm trying to express in a symbol and the reality behind it. So, for example, when the family gathers, and we usually gather in the vestibule if there's a casket, and we begin the, the mass or the funeral service in front of, if it's in the church, at, at, at the, in the sanctuary, if there's cremated remains normally, I still begin the same way by greeting everyone and then blessing either the casket, the, the, the body that's in the casket, or the cremains, and calling attention to an event that happened at the beginning of this person's life, or near the beginning of this person's life, namely their baptism. Right, or, or that time that they chose to... Or the time that they chose to become baptized, because it's a, a baptism, it's in a sense, it's a celebration of what happens at Easter. Jesus rises from the dead. Mm -hmm. So when we celebrate baptism, it's, it's an expression of, of our legacy, of Christ's legacy for us, that just as he rose, we will rise as well, and that there is a differentiation between body and soul, which we call the teach as a church. And so, while we have the, the body, either in its in, either in terms of uh, um, an intact body or uh, a, a set of cremains, that is the tabernacle or the house for the soul, our being. So, all that makes up our personality, our conscious, unconscious, subconscious state and our emotional state, our spiritual awareness, our personality, our sense of humor, our mind, that's all our soul. Well, we teach our soul is eternal. And that while the body dies, and scripture plays this out, while the body is corruptible, the soul is not. And so it is the soul upon death that goes and engages Christ in the throne room of, uh, of, of heaven which we call the particular judgment in the Catholic teaching, and in that conversation, our ultimate destiny then is given us. And so, fundamental to baptism is the sense that our life doesn't end when it appears to end. It kind of goes back to what you said about that, that Charlie Brown cartoon. You know, we only live once versus we only die once. Well, we die once, but our life in the spiritual sense, goes on. And it's not the same thing 
as Jews understood death and the afterlife as recalling the memories of a loved one, but there is a reality of our, our intelligent being continues to live in the presence and sight of God, which is what we call eternity. Father Gary, having participated and uh, been a funeral director, gone through school, having also uh, been through the seminary at 35 years now, mm -hmm. um, have both callings helped to improve your ability to uh, understand <coughs> where a family finds themselves in grief? Has there been a balance between both having seen the conduit that we are mm -hmm. and the path? And Yes, I, I think my years of working in funeral service was a very good training for my ministry as a Catholic priest when it comes to ministering to people who have lost loved ones, who have experienced death, and, and also being very, very mindful of how to celebrate you know, in a ritualistic, liturgical way um, the Catholic rite in, in its best form. So, uh, I think for one thing, what it, it, having worked in funeral service, it has certainly established a very, very nice repartee, an important repartee between myself and the local funeral directors with whom I interface. Absolutely. Um, and as you and I both know, when those relationships are good and positive, they do have a real, they can have a real um, uh, after effect upon uh, a family in time of grief uh, because the funeral director and, and the mortuary funeral home and the clergy and the parish all have to work together in order to really bring both um, agents of service together in a way that we're really working as a team so i really look at the, the local mortician the local funeral director um, as part of the team when we're actually trying to make sure that in the best interest of this family that ultimately we're trying to bring them consolation and, and take as much burden off them as possible. All right, meeting that expectation because in addition to that, and we've talked about it in the past, is also that cemetery. So if, if a family's going to the cemetery for sure. their committal services, you know, there's three different entities that all have very specific time frames that they need to honor so that they can provide an excellent service to someone and they don't look back and say, well, geez, we tried to do this and we couldn't. Right. Uh, but if we all work hand in hand. Right. You know, I'm, my, uh, I would say that I don't place as much, I don't place as much emphasis on the cemetery part per se. However, I am very aware of because I deal with cemeteries as well, of making sure that the times that we've established are also going to work for the cemetery. So the cemetery is an integral aspect of this because it depends on what their own schedule is on a given day. So while I tend to place more weight on the funeral home, I also have to deal with the cemetery, but oftentimes more tangentially than the funeral home does. Sure. Louder. Okay, one of the things that I... I uh, um, I want to discuss because it's something that families can't prepare themselves through. And, and my grief path, someone said, uh, be careful of, um, in my grief path, someone said, be careful for grief lawyers and people that are just there because they like the, the, the train wreck. They like the fact that there's chaos and also they'll come into your life. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, be mindful of the things that people say and don't, don't take that to heart. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that people are well-meaning mm -hmm. and they need relief or maybe guidance through that because you lose, you know, your life partner, your husband, your wife, a child, and then someone comes to you with good intention. Mm -hmm. How would you guide someone to the, through the silly things that people say? Well, having been a recipient myself of a near-death experience a long time ago where some people said all very well-meaning, some very inappropriate things to me, uh, I do understand that sometimes people, in their attempt to want to say something that's meaningful, they don't have a language. They don't have a language to express um, their feelings in such a way as to be thoughtful about how their words are going to come across to someone else. So what I, as, a, as sort of a guiding principle, will say to people is when you're not exactly sure what to say, say nothing. 
and simply go and say, I'm very sorry for your loss, or I'm very sorry for your grief. It's because that's, those are very empathic words, but they're also, so, they're, they're also fairly neutral words. It acknowledges that the person is in, in, in pain. It acknowledges that a death has occurred but it really helps to avoid other kinds of, of, of words and terminology that may be confusing in terms of how they're received. So I'll give you a good example. Uh, 21 years ago, I had a very uh, severe um, hiking accident in Yosemite. And I was with a friend and I had a, a little trans ischemic accident, basically a mild stroke on the hike we were on. And I fell, I fell 60 feet off a cliff. And I was, I should have died. And, and that's not being overly dramatic. I broke my neck, fractured my skull, broke my wrist, shattered my elbow, broke my knee, I was a mess. Make a long story short, I came back to the parish about four months later to begin picking up the pieces and having them sort of put back together again. And I lost, I lost 45 pounds and had a, a number one buzz cut because I had my head shaved because of the fractured skull and the wounds. And a woman came out from church on the first Sunday I was there and said to me, quote, God just wanted you to take a rest. And I got very upset and animated because I said, what kind of God do you pray to? That God would somehow be responsible for me having this horrendous, horrific accident and that somehow God wasn't there other than to help me through it, but that in a sense was the prime cause. I said, that's not the God to whom I pray. So that is a real true experience I had that even to this day, the fact that I can tell you about it means I still remember it. Right. And so oftentimes people will say really inappropriate things because they don't know what to say and they don't know how to say them. But more often than not, they don't have a language to be able to convey their inmost feelings when it comes to grief. And so sometimes they just don't, they say the wrong things. With, with good intent. With good, I feel it's always with good intention. You know, the um, uh, he's in a better place, or um, or it's God's you know, will. It's God's, yeah. and you're thinking, I'm, I'm not. Whether maybe you believe that, or it's right. part of your right. faith structure. Right. Think to yourself. Right. That was bold. Right. You know, maybe just a hug right. and a pair of ears. Exactly. And I, I, I oftentimes will say, your presence speaks louder than any words can deliver. So keep the words short, especially when you don't know what to say or how to convey your emotions. Keep it short, and if you don't know what to say, say nothing. And as to your point, give the person, touching is very appropriate, a hug, um, a handshake, but a hug certainly, an embrace, because people oftentimes, there is something to be said. I read something once where everybody needs six hugs a day. Now, I don't know how true that is, but I read that somewhere. <laughs> But I think there is something about our the sort of the essence of our human nature that um, human touch is very very important. And even uh, psychologists have talked about this. You know that a child up to the age of six, you can never love the child enough. And sometimes even children will say, as adults, they were never hugged, they were never told they were loved, no one ever gave them any kind of embrace. They were not paid attention to. And I think all of those things have their own way of affecting a person's psyche that goes on into adult life. Um, the hug is, uh, I was at a, a rotary meeting and we had someone that teaches autistic children and he was talking about the hug and the physical barrier, the spatial barrier, the things that are not understood in that social norm world and how they have to teach that. And the hug is one of the hardest things to teach. It's just something you know. If I show up at my work one day and I, I have staff and team members, I don't walk up and hug them, but if I have a holiday party, you hug them. Right. You know. And then I think there's never a more appropriate place to give somebody that, um, I saw this image the other day of the jumper cables, like I have jumper cables for you, mm -hmm. and they're my arms, and I'm gonna put them around you and that's me jump-starting or, or helping your heart continue. I just, it was a nice imagery. Mm -hmm. But the hug is so important. 
Um, but still very difficult to define. When do you do this? When is it appropriate? Right, no, and I think there's, right, there's truth to that. I don't initiate hugs unless someone wants, unless I know the person would receive it well. If I meet a person for the first time, I, don't, I never give a hug. Occasionally someone will give me a hug who I don't know. I'm okay with it, but it, it's like, okay, I don't know you. So to me, a hug has something to do with the, the level of relationship. And I also think, it's um, what is the occasion mm -hmm. when that's given. Yeah, and I think it's all about timeliness. Yeah, and uh, certainly and if you're at a funeral and you're there because that person was important to you mm -hmm. by however many degrees, mm -hmm. walking up and sometimes not saying the wrong thing, mm -hmm. but just saying, I'm here if you ever need a parent. Exactly. And, uh, and embrace. Mm -hmm. um, another question, uh, things that we've talked to, and this, this actually was presented to me by a friend and another individual that uh, I've had the opportunity to interview, Jack Longley. And he asked this question, jokingly, as a minister and person of faith, how old are we when we're in heaven? And I thought, and it was a little tongue in cheek, but he said, no one has ever, I, I propose that question, I yeah. pose that question to people from time to time and they kind of look at me and they're like, well, I'm my age, but if you're a young child or right. if, if um, my wife passes away mm -hmm. and we're in our 30s or 40s and I live to my 80s, mm -hmm. when we meet again, how old are we? Mm -hmm. have, you, have you ever thought that? Has, has anyone ever asked you that question? No one's ever asked me that question, but I have thought about it in terms of, um, uh, will we recognize, like my mother, when my father died five years ago, my mother said to me, and she's very devout in her faith as a Catholic. She said, will I ever see your father again? I says, yes. She says, well, I recognize him. I said, I assume so, but that's God's job. So if a person dies at a very young age, are they stuck at the age in which they die? I don't have, I, there is nothing scripturally. Right. <laughs> who, who can... I, I don't have, I don't have, I don't know. Yes. But I figured, I think God has got to figure it out. But there there has to have been, yeah. yes. Whether we're in this valley, so we can call it an algorithm, but maybe. Right, you know, so if a child dies, you know, before birth, does that does that child before birth remain a child before birth, age-wise? I don't know the answer. As opposed to somebody who dies and they're 100. I don't know. Yeah, because you... you yeah. Um... And when we die, will we recognize each other in the afterlife? I assume so, but I don't know how. Uh, I had listened to a, a gentleman recently that was talking about the way that we can restructure our brain and how it works. Mm -hmm. And he saw a friend after 35 years at a reunion that he hadn't attended many times. And he walks in and he sees someone from across the room with no hair, mm -hmm. um, aged and without social media. Mm -hmm. And he walks in and he says, Doug, how are you? Mm -hmm. So I think we already know how to do that. Our eyes mm -hmm. can age. We've aged and we see it. But mm -hmm. uh, it was an interesting question he he posed. And I you know I think about myself in my 20s and you're there and you're like, this is the greatest time. And mm -hmm. thankfully my 20s are gone. <laughs> so maybe it's a different time. Uh, another question. When a family is entering into funeral service, or, or they're, they're needing guidance, I need to make a plan um, early on, maybe before hospice, mm -hmm. during hospice. Is it the funeral liturgy that you focus on? Is it, um, and this isn't a, a call for a funeral home or anything like right. that, but what would your guidance be? Well, if I think it would depend on the situation, but if, 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 if a family called and said, um, that their loved one was, was moving toward hospice or moving into hospice, then in the Catholic tradition, we have what's called the sacrament of the sick. And, and the sacrament of the sick is one of the seven sacraments. It once upon a time was referred to as the as extreme unction or the last anointing. It no longer is, because we went back to an original understanding of the sacrament, which was when people were sick in the early church, the priest and the people together went, the community went and laid hands and, and anointed the person with blessed oil. Which we, know, which we do, and usually we try very hard to make sure that there are some members of the family who are present for that. If it's in that same vein, I will sometimes bring up to them, when I say sometimes, it, again, it depends on the, where, the, where the family is in their emotional state. I'll say, you know, have you given any thought to 
the how you plan to ritualize the person's death after death. Have you thought about any kind of a funeral or a memorial? And it is it, it's sort of a it's sort of something I do by braille. It's sort of like if I think it's appropriate, depending how well I know them, depending on their emotional state, depending on what's transpired that's brought them to come and see me, if it's a sudden death or a, an, a car accident or some trauma, more likely than not, I'm not going to bring that up because they're still grasp, grasp, grasping, grappling with the fact that this sudden experience now has thrust them into a whole different place. So I would probably likely not bring up anything about funeral. Um, but if it's about someone who's aged and now they're moving through the process of, of uh, age leading to death in a more gradual way, more likely than not, I would obviously go under both circumstances, whether it's sudden or whether it isn't, and go and say, would you like me to come and anoint the person with the sacrament of the sick? And then probably talk about if something is like really pending, um, would you be open to a conversation about you know, a future, a future funeral memorial. So it's a judgment call, yeah. but I think it depends on the circumstances. Do you have any type of therapy uh, for families, maybe prior to or after? Um, I know that personally for me, journaling and writing letters has been therapeutic. Is there anything like that, that uh, within that ministry there at Sacred Heart that you would guide people to or? Um, I think it would depend. It's on an individual basis. Sure. I, I would say to them, uh, you know, do you do you believe that you need some kind of outside professional help at this time? Because I don't feel well. I don't. I'm. I don't believe I'm qualified to really help people with those kinds of skills having to do with journaling or other kinds of processing other than basic stuff. So I would refer them out. But I usually will ask that question of them at the time when we we start when we're talking about uh, planning the funeral. And then there's always a follow-up by a member of our bereavement committee within a week, if not by just, me, by somebody on the base. committee, just to touch base. But we also have an annual memorial mass every November, on the first Saturday in November at the 5 o'clock mass, where everybody in the parish who has experienced the loss of a loved one is invited to come. And all the names of everybody who's either had their, had their funeral through our parish or who lost a loved one, had the funeral somewhere else that we are aware of because we pray for all those by name who are aware of or people notify us. They're all invited to come where we announce all the names and they bring a candle forward at the very beginning of Mass. It's very actually very therapeutic and very it cathartic. Is. It really is. To, to hear someone's name, to be sitting in a, yeah. um, the church and you're hearing all these names and yeah. that connection, that that that's someone that someone's lost and you're just preparing for it and then they, you hear that you hear your loved one's name and it's also like you know the wind is taken out of you and then you get to do this beautiful gesture which is to light a candle and there's so much uh there's so much symbol symbolism and mm -hmm. the ability to light a candle well it says something about the fact that the person matters and that they're not forgotten and i think it's important that we as a church do that um, I would like to ask some kind of rapid fire questions that people might be interested in because when they think about um, faith and religion and, and faith leaders, they're looking for maybe guidance in that arena uh, and things that maybe you've thought about. And have you made the decision whether you'll be buried or cremated? A burial or cremation? I've gone back and forth between whether I'll be buried or cremated, and I think at this point I'm going to be buried. Um, I have plan on having my cremated remains after the funeral placed with my mother and dad. Over the last number of years, I think I've decided I'm going to be buried in the priest plot at Gate of Heaven Cemetery, which would be right adjacent to where my parents' grave is presently at, at this time. Um, so, late to rest in the cemetery, and will you have funeral service? I believe I know this, but I yeah. still it's a... Oh, sure. For I think for any Catholic priest, and uh, I've, I've presided at the funeral of of two priests myself and preached. One was my uncle, my dad's brother, another was one of the pastors I grew up with in the parish I came from. Yeah, I, I think they're, you know, I think a priest having a funeral um, is an expression that not only um, 
you know that we're part of the, we're part of the faith community too. So we we're wounded healers. So we're not perfect people, obviously, and so we die like anyone else. And so I think you know the prayers of the mass would be altered slightly as it applies to a priest or a bishop at the time of the funeral. But the funeral liturgy, the structure would be the same. So yeah, I mean I, it would be most appropriate for. Uh, an ordained cleric in the Roman Catholic tradition to to have a, a traditional funeral with a body present or cremains present. This is a follow-up question because I, I believe I know the answer as a funeral director, but I could be a hundred percent wrong. Why is it that when um, we as funeral professionals and a priest and the altar staff bring someone into the church that we are um, foot first, and then when a priest is brought into the church, that they enter the church head first. I think I know, but this might be like a thing of lyrics that I've been singing wrong for years. Okay. That's actually a very good question. The reason that the, 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 the body of a non-ordained would be brought in foot first was because the non-ordained are part of the assembly of the church. Because an ordained cleric has a, has a specific role having to do with holy orders and therefore service at the altar is the reason why the, the priest would come in head first or the deacon or bishop would come in head first as opposed okay. to feet first. It has to do with their place in terms of the right. assembly. Right, so we were standing looking right. out versus right. in... Right. The, okay, right. I was right but I, I, there yeah. could have been, yeah. I could have been way off on that. I feel good about yeah. that for all these years. I had asked that myself <laughs> when, I was, when I was running funerals. Why do we do this differently for priests than we do this for everybody else? <laughs> Because the only priest that, whose funeral I ever ran was when the, the pastor of St. Mary's died in uh, 81, uh, 82, De Cowley. Uh, Jeff would remember him. Um, uh, Bill Smith and I ran the funeral. And uh, actually I have, um, I have a communion pyx that his sister gave me that was his. Yeah, oh. So he was 76. He'd been there for quite a long time, but he was very ill when he died. And then we ran most, in those days, we ran most all the funerals at St. Mary's. I ran lots of funerals there. Um, how long will you be at Sacred Heart? I know that sometimes within the diocese right. you move, I know that that's always a difficult change yeah. for uh, parishioners. Yeah. Is there... Well, we're on terms. And I'm actually, I'm actually overdue. The current bishop doesn't like to move people after they're 60. I've been at Saratoga 12, or 13, I'm in my 13th year. Usually 12 is the max, but it's really at the discretion of the bishop, although usually when you're done with 12, it's time to go. So when I finished St. Nicholas, I didn't wait for him to say it's time to go. I gave him a year's notice and said, next year's my last year, will be my 12th year. I want to go do sabbatical. I had ordained 22 years at that point. So I went to Rome, oh, stu studied, out of, you know, trained under an exorcist, took the course in exorcism, became the exorcist of the diocese. That was only a part of what I did in my sabbat. I'm exorcist of the diet. I don't know if you knew Yes. That. Okay. So um, now I'm on my 13th year, so, and I'm 65. So I went to see um, PJ, that's, his, that's what his nickname is. I went to see PJ a year ago. Now he was getting ready to retire. And then he had an accident, he had an accident, fell down, he had a back surgery. So the new succeeding bishop came much earlier than we thought he was going to. And, and PJ was, is going to retire this year. So it's a, I don't know whether or not, I had asked that I not be moved this year, maybe the following year. We're getting ready to do more fundraising at our place. And so I'd like to be part of at least the beginning of that if I could. Plus I want the new guy to be there a while before I get moved, if I'm going to get before moved that, again. that baton is handed yeah. off. Yeah. I, I remember when Father Tom Tank left my parish as a uh, kid and it was... I didn't understand any of it. I just, yeah. who's this new guy? Right. Why is he here? Well, and when I left St. Nicholas, I got up and told everybody, we are on terms. So, because I, I, we had had a misconduct situation that, that came years before I got there, but it actually didn't happen at St. Nicholas. It happened at St. Martin at Tours, involving a pastor who actually had taught me in high school, at Sarah High School. And um, so... I was hypersensitive because when all that came out, it came out in 2001. I was leaving in 2005. I mean, we had moved beyond it. However, you know, it was still on people's minds. So I said, you know, the bishop isn't, there's, there's, there's no scandal. 
this is you know normal operating procedure at the end of 12 years it's normal for a pastor to be moved and so I'm taking the initiative now because I'm going into my 22nd year and I need I need a I need a break so so then I went on sabbatical and then but I had to come home early because we had problems with Sacred Heart so I had to come home two months early for my sabbatical and take the parish huh. so anyway but I was meant to go there I know they love having you, it, oh. you're, you know, a, a part of the fabric of the entire community. Um, what song or songs, I, I, I think music is one of the most important things that guides us through. Is it entirely faith-based? If you're having a traditional Catholic funeral liturgy, what music would accompany that service? Well, you, there's a wide repertoire of liturgical music uh, that would fit different rhythms in the course of the Mass. I always talk about the Mass as like a dinner party. You just don't walk in the house and go to the table and say, let's eat, usually. There's a whole ritual. And so from the greeting to the dismissal, there's cadences in the Mass. And so you use different, different movements, different tempos at different times of the Mass. And then you do try and pick music that might be, you know, what would be something that would kind of put people in the mood of prayer, something that's got some more life to it. There's other points in the liturgy that are more meditative, so you want to have meditative type music, such as the Ave Maria, mm -hmm. uh, or some other song that may simply be a, a song of, that, that has more of a reflective quality than it does a participatory quality. And then as well, and this is kind of to some degree at the discretion of each priest, you know, if a, if, a, if a person has some favorite song that is not churchy, but whose lyrics somehow can complement the Mass or the service outside of Mass, I'm not opposed to having something that's of a, say, a secular nature, as long as it's something that will complement the, the Mass itself or say something about the person, generally speaking. Do you have anything that's secular or contemporary that would, uh, a song that you love? Um... There isn't anything that really stands out in my mind. There was a song that I, I would, I don't permit it at funerals. That's it, it's Sinatra's, go, I, I did it my way. <laughs> because I did allow that once, and as I'm listening to the lyrics, I'm going, this is antithetical to what we're just celebrating. <laughs> and uh, so, it's a great song. It's just, I wouldn't have it at a, I wouldn't have it at a funeral. Right, but at the reception. Oh sure, people yeah. can. I mean, reception to me as long as it, or even if they wanted to do have that song like before the the, the liturgy itself starts, I'm fine with that. It's just that it, it really kind of goes against the whole notion that we are saved not by us, we are saved by God, and as apply as as opposed to I did it my way, you know, instead of the Lord's way. But um, you know, I mean, I've had. Um, you know, uh, Judy Garland music, uh, I've had uh, Irish music, um, um, uh, I've had uh, Louis Armstrong songs sung a couple of times. Um, again, I think if it's something that was near and dear to the person or near and dear to the couple that may have identified their marriage or something that, was, that, that people identified them with, and I usually bring this up, if there's something that you'd like to have sung or played instrumentally, that's outside of sort of the realm of the church, as long as it will complement the liturgy, I'm not opposed to it, as long as the majority of the music is liturgical, as right. opposed to something from Led Zeppelin or, you know, the Jefferson <laughs> Starship or something like that. You oh, know, because, right. I mean, you know, even there are... Maybe no ELO, right? Yeah. Electrical light orchestra. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, um, uh, there isn't anything that stands out that I, that I have a particular favorite as it applies to something that's secular. In terms of church music, um, uh, like Ave Maria is a sort of a, that song sort of transcends any season because the, the role of the Blessed Mother in the whole economy of salvation is that she served as, as the mother of the Word and so she was the first vocation in the, in, the God, in the New Testament to say yes to the will of God when she accepted the role that was offered to her. Um, 
And that just that song and the melodies and because the song is sung in Latin, you know, people don't. It's the it's just, it's the lyrics are really to the Hail Mary, but there is something about that song that elicits the divine. It just does. It just it brings um, thoughts of the holy up in the way it's written and the way it's sung. That it, it it's good for any occasion. Right. That's and, a, and, 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 it, and it's never it never it's it's it never is it never grows tiresome for people. Uh, I think the the first time I um, similar song and I'm uh, from Iowa or my family is from Iowa so the first funerals I ever attended were for grandparents. That was the first time I ever heard of Danny Boy. Yeah. And okay. we'll always. Yeah. I can't hear that song well, without being uh, in I, church at my grandmother's sure. funerals. Yeah. yeah. And and there's a certain um, a lot of the Irish. Uh, um, ballads they're, they're all they're all tell stories and there's kind of a melancholy to a lot of their to their stories and I'm, I'm half Irish myself and I have family in Ireland so yeah, yeah I do and Danny Boy is, is uh, yeah there, there's a great melancholy to that song uh, what are you up to uh, things that you're currently working on um, we've mentioned you've touched on uh, this 13th year and potentially segueing or bringing someone to pass the baton to. Is there anything else that you're working on that you'd like to share with listeners? Well, we're getting ready to do some more remodeling in terms of the, the plant uh, that really needs to be done. I mean, the church, the, the parish itself was established 68 years ago. And so, you know, facilities do wear out and they do need upgrading. And so we're, we're probably moving toward another capital campaign, which we just finished the last one two years ago. Um, we're, we just started a new Bible, uh, Bible study series through our, the, the person who we just uh, brought on, uh, who's our faith formation, adult, cor adult faith formation coordinator, who's doing a really fine job and established a new Bible studies. Uh, our, our new evangelization coordinator uh, is now organizing the parish in such a way that we're doing a lot more outreach and, and we just... Uh, became one of the 12 power, the churches in Saratoga that is, that is um, uh, participating in the Safe Car Park uh, program that Saratoga has set up. And we're hoping uh, in November of this year that we'll house the homeless in the church for a month, which is now becoming also um, a project that uh, the churches in Saratoga are, are also um, embracing. And wow. so, yeah. How can anyone get involved in Car Park? In the, in the... Well, um, they can call and speak to uh, our evangelization coordinator who also happens to be our parish administrator and she oversees the social justice committee for the parish and we're certainly looking for more help and, and we had 70 people involved actually with this uh, Safe Car Park uh, project for the month of December and we it's limited to 15 people or 15 cars but 15 persons but it's mostly for it's for people who just can't afford they can't afford housing because of the high cost of housing in Silicon Valley. Most of these people all have jobs. Uh, they shower and uh, take care of their hygiene needs at the local YMCA. Um, but we provide them with meals and, uh, and a safe haven to park their car um, for a month at a time. And then they work through a, a vetting process that the Ministerial Association in Saratoga set up. Is there a way that uh, individuals or businesses can donate to that to sponsor it to, to help in any way? Sure, they can. That? They can just call the parish and speak specifically to our our parish administrator, Janice Thornburg. Um, there's so many outlets that people reach out to these days to find and contact individuals. Is there social media presence for uh, yourself or Sacred Heart? We have a we have a parish website. Probably the best way to reach me would be my email address or by phone, but certainly by my email address, which is on the website. I don't know if you want to know it now, but it's certainly on the website. It's okay. g.thomas at sacredheartsaratoga.org. And are you guys involved in any social media letting folks know you guys do a great carnival every year? Um, we have Facebook. Facebook? Yeah. Facebook, Sacred Heart, Saratoga. I'm not sure what the address <laughs> is, personally. I well, just know we, we have it and people can have access to it. But the website is probably the best way to best way. Yeah, is best way to have contact with. And us. any uh, information I know that my family and I uh, attend the carnival. Is there information you want to share when it happens throughout the year? It always is every October. The carnival is every October. It's a fundraiser. 
Um, it, but it also is a community builder, so we don't do it just to raise funds for the parish, but it is a way to really invite people within the community to come check us out and also have a lot of fun. It's very wholesome. Uh, we have plenty of security. Uh, it's a great opportunity for both uh, people of all ages to uh, to come and enjoy an afternoon or an evening or a whole day. I mean, we have uh, we have uh, we have local bands uh, throughout the course. We have entertainment all day long and into the night. We have uh, lots of rides. We have lots of food booths, um, and then we also have a we have a stage where we also bring local talent, uh, whether it's kids dancing or singing or playing instruments. Uh, we have a, we have a magic show. We have a guy in the parish who is a magician professionally, and uh, who comes and does a magic show for us, which is great for the kids. But there's really something there for everybody to enjoy, and it's usually the second or third weekend in October, depending on whether uh, what what uh, what weekend we get from the carnival company that provides all the rides. That usually determines the, the weekend, but it's usually the, usually almost it's always the second or third weekend in October. Well, I, I've been, and usually when you go to an event like that, the thing that you're worried or concerned about is parking and, you know, how do I get into it? It was uh, a seamless event to go and attend, have fun, ride the Ferris wheel with uh, the kids and kind of see Saratoga. That's a great vantage point to be sitting on the top of that Ferris wheel, right. looking out over the church yeah. and uh, across the street, another congregation, seeing uh, all yeah. of Saratoga. Um, Thank you so much. We have been sitting here talking about faith, grief, um, funeral liturgy, uh, Catholicism with Father Gary Thomas from Sacred Heart and Saratoga. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to share this. I'm enlightened uh, by our conversation for things that I wasn't aware of. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to start this was um, how do I get to learn more about the families and the communities that I serve? Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing part of your day with us. Sure. You're most welcome, You're most welcome Nicholas. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I hope this will be beneficial to all those who uh, listen to and watch this dialogue. Thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. You we need to make sure that families know that life needs to be celebrated.